Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss market structured and pricing strategies. What is market structure? We refer to the organizational characteristic of a market. What is that? It includes the number of firms operating in the market, the degree of competition among them, and the exit and entry barrier. What does that all mean? Let's take a look at this market. So this is the market here. In this market, basically, we have one, two, three sellers. So the number of operating firm in this market, three. Now, how tough or how stiff is the competition between those? Well, it all depends on the product that they're selling. Is it unique product, not unique product? On other factors, such as the uniqueness of the product that they're selling. Are they selling something that is considered a commodity where you can find everywhere or are they selling something unique? Also, how competitive are they in terms of pricing their product? It all depends how many people can enter this market. If, let's assume this is operating in a small town, if the, municip if the municipality of the small town allows three other firms to operate and everyone is selling the same product, then guess what's going to happen? The prices the, their pricing strategy will change. So different market structure will have different implication for pricing strategies. Now, why as accountant, as CPAs, we have to learn about market structures? Because at some point you might be auditing a company or preparing financial statement of a company. You have to understand in what type of market structure this company operates. So you can understand their pricing strategy. You can understand the revenue structure. And that's very important. Revenue is the first item on the financial statement. And how the company price their product will drive their revenue. There are four common market structures that we need to be familiar with. Perfect competition, monopoly. Those are the two extremes. So we have monopoly and the perfect competition on either extreme. Then we have monop monopolistic competition and we have oligopoly. What we're going to do, we're going to discuss each one of these market structures separately, including the various pricing strategies that companies would undertake assuming they are operating in this market structure. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. Starting with perfect competition. What is a perfect competition? Well, let's take a look at this picture. Before I discuss perfect competition, this picture is a perfect competition. Okay, those are two stores, store one and store two. And here we go, those are two stores. Okay, and notice they're basically selling the same thing, basically selling the same thing. They're close to each other. Let's assume, I believe these are corns. So this lady is selling corns and this individual is selling corns as well. And she's selling tomatoes and he's selling tomatoes. Guess what? In this type of market, they're selling the same product. They are, they are going to compete on the price. Why? Because this customer here, this lady here, she's going to look at the both product and we're going to assume and they're bringing the they're bringing the, the tomatoes from the same suppliers or the tomatoes are fairly the same and the corn is fairly the same. So they're going to basically, since, since they are also close to each other, they are going to price, price the product almost the same. So they are dealing in a perfect competition. In a perfect competition, there's a large, large number of small firms producing homogeneous product, producing or selling homogeneous product, the same product, with no single firm having control over the market. What does that mean? It means this individual cannot control. It means this individual, for example, they cannot have too many tomatoes or too many corns to control the market. So everybody is basically don't have don't have extra power. So the key feature of a perf perfect competition is many buyers and sellers, 
as I mentioned, no individual buyer or seller can influence the market price. So who sets the price then? The market sets the price. Supply and demand will set the price. Homogen homogeneous product, the products are identical. So the consumer, this, in the, this lady here, she has no preference for one seller over the other, other than the price. And the price cannot be easily raised. So again, if one of these sellers raise the price, the customer will go to the other uh, to the other uh, seller. There's a perfect information. Buyers and sellers have access to all relevant market information. It means there's nothing hidden about the corn, nothing hidden about the tomatoes that both parties are selling. And there is easy market entry and easy exit entry. What does that mean? It means we have those two stores here. We can easily bring another store, open a third store and a fourth store. So in a perfect competition, well, you can easily enter the market. And simply put, in a perfect competition, you, you, your profit is close to zero. Why? Because you are competing on price. Okay. So prices are determined by the factors of, of su supply and demand. So individual firms are price takers, not price setters. Price takers means what? It means whatever the market determined the price, they have to go with that price. What does that mean? Let's just, let, let me give you an example about this. Let's assume this, this seller here, this gentleman bought the corn last week and the bushel of the corn was, let's assume, $6. Okay? Now, in order to sell it, he got to sell it for more than $6. This lady here, she bought her supplies today and the market happens to be $5. So she bought, she bought the, she bought it one dollar less than him so she can sell it for 450 and still make a profit he's going to be forced to either take a loss or not be not be able to sell his corn why because now the price dropped so in a perfect competition the firms are pri price takers it's set by the market it's set by the market an example of perfect competition will be agricultural product wheat corn often exhibit characteristic of perfect competition. Basically, the price of the wheat is known. There's plenty of supply, plenty of demand, unless there's there's a shortage. Same thing with corn. So what is the pricing competition? The pricing strategies in a perfect competition? Again, firms are price takers. The focus is on maximizing efficiency. How do you make money in, when you operate in a perfect competition? You want to reduce your cost. It means operating at a maximum efficiency. You are going to, you're going to accept the market, as I mentioned this, and adjust your output level accordingly. You might have to cut, you might have to increase, depending on the market forces. Sometime in a perfect competition, firms operate, operate on a cost-based pricing. What's cost-based pricing? It means I'm going to try to sell my product, the, min the minimum, just to try to cover my cost. Set their prices based on production cost aiming to cover their expenses and achieve small or a normal profit margin. So how do so how do companies in a perfect competition makes a lot of money? For example, Walmart. Walmart is in a perfect competition because if you don't like Walmart, you can go to Target. If you don't like Mar Walmart or Target, you can go to Amazon. Th that's a perfect competition. So if you're making a small profit, how do you how these how do these companies operate? They make small profit but they sell a lot. They'll try to gain a market share. So their concern is to maintain their market share and increase their market share. So since prices are standardized, uh, firms differentiate themselves through factors such as product quality, customer service, or branding. Now, how can this individual differentiate themselves from the other seller? The gentleman can differentiate themselves from the lady or the lady can differ differentiate themselves from the gentleman. For example, the lady could say, look, you buy it, go ahead, finish your shopping. I will deliver the product to your home. So basically I'll provide you some extra customer service or this gentleman can present their product as better product, somehow convince this lady that what he's selling is better corn, that better corn than the other store. Okay, so, so, so marketing here plays a big role in branding. Otherwise you have no extra competitive advantage and a perfect competition. Another market is called a monopoly. A monopoly is the other extreme of perfect competition. Here you have one single firm is the sole provider of a particular product or service in the market. Now, monopolies, generally speaking, are illegal, are illegal. For example, the U.S. government can, does not allow co companies to have a monopoly. 
for example, Microsoft at some point it had a monopoly and the Department of Justice made sure they don't. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment. So you have a single seller that dominate the whole market. There is no close substitute. There are no viable alternative. You either buy our product or you have no other option. For example, utility companies and utility companies in some area, one utility company, they cover a wide geographical area. Because of that, if you want electricity, if you want gas for your home, you only have one supplier. Well, that's a monopoly. You don't have an alternative. You don't have an alternative. And there's a high barriers to entry. High bar barriers mean, well, you cannot just start a utility company in that area because you need a large capital expenditure, billions and billions of dollars. You need government approval. Uh, you need so many different licenses. So there's a high barrier to entry when you have a monopoly. So new firms, it, it, it prevent them from entering. And in a monopoly, you have a pr pricing power. You don't care about market share because you have the whole market. So what you do now, you can set the prices that you want, but you don't want to set your prices too high where you upset the citizens as well as the government. So you have a substantial control over prices versus the perfect competition. You have no control whatsoever. Here you are a price setter, not a price taker. You set the price. Okay. So in a monopoly, the firm has the power to set prices based on its market dominance. Now, Unregulated monopolies, example, uh, as I told you in the US, we don't have this, can potentially exploit their market and charge as high as they can. In some world countries, you have unregulated monopolies. In the US, we'll try to keep them, we'll try to keep them under control. Examples, utilities with exclusive service territories. For example, Apple computers, their first iPhone, the first six month, the first six month in the life of the first iPhone, Apple had a monopoly. If you wanted a smartphone, that was the only viable option. They were a monopoly by default. They did not try to be a monopoly. They simply they did not have a competition. Then Samsung came along and they started to present other alternative. But this is what a monopoly is. So firm and a monopoly aim to optimize their profit while considering their market power. So they cannot go, you know, uh, uh, out of control. Uh, differentiation and competitive pressure within the respective market structure. So they will try to kind of make profit, but at the same time, keep the pressure off. So they, they don't want you to kind of enter the market as well, give you any incentive. Okay. The pricing strategy in, in a monopoly, it includes profit maximization. As I just said, you set your own prices, but you take into account cost structure and demand elasticity. Uh, wh when I say you have a price pricing power. Well, if you charge too much, then what happened to your sales? Nobody wants to buy your product, right? So you have to kind of charge, but, you know, keep it, uh, keep it reasonable. <laughs> price discrimination. The monopolist, the, the, the monopolist charges different prices to different customer segment based on their willingness to pay. Also, they can charge different people different prices based on the, you know, if they can provide them extra service, they can charge this. Barrier pricing. They want to price their product to keep competition out, to deter potential entrant and protect its market dominance. So they don't want to make too much profit, too much profit, and it's worth it for a competitor to come in and invest billions of dollars. For example, going back to the utility companies, if they're making a lots, a lots, a lots of profit, then investors will kind of join together and start a utility company because there's a lot of profit to make. So you don't want it to make it look it's there's a lot of profit, unlimited profit, then people will enter the market. So somehow you price your product to keep to keep new new competition out. You could also bundle your product. The monopolist offer product or services together at a combined price to increase sales and capture more more value. A case in point is Microsoft. In, in 1995 Microsoft had Windows 95, Windows 95. That was the first kind of graphic user interface operating window-based system, Windows 95. And from 1995 till 2001, 2003, Windows dominated the market PC. At that point in 96, 97, we started to have the internet, okay? So what happened is, what would Microsoft do? Every time they sell you their Windows, they will bundle with it Netscape Navigator. I'm not sure you guys don't know what Netscape Navigator is. Think of Chrome. Think of the first version of something like Chrome. Chrome is the web browser, but Chrome is for Google. You have Chrome, you have Firefox, you have different web browser. Back then what Microsoft did, every time they sold you Windows 95, they bundled with it Netscape Navigator. So what happened with all these 
um, web browser developer, well, they they could not compete because no one's gonna buy their product if everybody if everyone is buying Windows 95 comes with it comes with it Netscape Navigator. Why would someone invest in a web browser until obviously the market break them? It's important to know that these strategies are not exhaustive, and firms within each market may structure. Uh, each, in each market structure may employ additional or hybrid pricing approaches based under specific circumstances and objective. The key point is to understand what a monopoly in general is. Monopoly is basically you have control, basically you have no competition. You are, you are a price setter, but you have to be very careful not to be too greedy because you're going to either upset the citizen, your potential customers, or the government. Then we have monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition combines both the the perfect com uh, the perfect competition and monopoly. We talked about the perfect competition and monopoly. So something in between. It involves a large number of firms producing differentiated product. Okay, what's differentiated product? Firms sells products that are similar but not identical, creating some sort of a product differentiation. When you think of monopolistic competition, think of the fast food industry. Think of McDonald's. BK, Burger King, okay, Wendy's, Wendy's, those are all, they, they operate in a monopolistic competition. They sell the same product, but somehow they want, you know, burgers, basically, food, soda, french fries, they try to differentiate themselves, okay? So, individual firms have limited control over their market price because there are many buyers and sellers. Now, if McDonald's increased their prices a lot, they would lose, okay? So, they basically, as long as they keep their prices close to Burger King, Burger King keep their prices close to Wendy's, that's fine, they can live together. They rely on advertising and branding. Firms engage in non-pricing competition through advertising and marketing efforts. So they'll try to differentiate themselves, and I'm pretty sure you see a lot of ads for them. There are easy entry and exit, okay? And so the barrier to entry is are relatively low. They're not very high, relatively low, but to, to compete, it's going to be tough. But it's it's not like comp, it's like, like it's not like a monopoly where it's like it's prohibitive. Okay, so relatively low. Okay, perfect competition, perfectly low. It's very low. Relatively low in a monopolistic competition. Okay, they can adjust their prices based on perceived product uniqueness and consumer preference. So what they do, they'll try to make you feel what you're buying is something better than the other competition. For example, Burger King, they would say, well. Uh, our product is better because, you know, and they'll try to kind of give you a reason why, okay, to convince you that they want to charge you a little bit more. So the fast food industries with various chains offering slightly different menus is an example of a monopolistic competition, okay? Some price, uh, some monopolistic competition pricing features, again, they set their prices based on the perceived uniqueness or added value to their product compared to their competition. Price discrimination firms charge different prices to different customer segments based on their willingness to pay. If they can find a segment where they can charge it more, then they will do that. Promotional pricing. Firms use sales, discounts, or special offers to attract customers and, and differentiate their offering. Well, I'm pretty sure in the U.S., if you live in the U.S., you would receive discounts from McDonald's, discount from Burger King to do what? To help increase their sales, to attract you to their store. And firms invest in advertising and marketing and branding campaign to do one thing, create a distinct market position. They want you to think they are different. They want you to think they are different, but they are not really different, but they want you to think. And based on that perceived uniqueness, they can charge you a little bit more. Then we have a leg up, a leg. Then we have, then we get to the oligopoly. Oligopoly. The first thing you think of when you think of oligop oligopoly is OPEC. What is OPEC? The Organization of Petroleum Export Countries. And this is, this is, I don't think this is a comprehensive list, but this is a list of these countries. Here, oligopoly exists when few large firms, or in this situation, countries, dominate the market, either due to high barrier entry or strategic behavior or the uniqueness of the product. You need to have oil. Okay, the key features, few large firms, um, few large firms, a small number of firms control a significant share of the market. These countries control the large proportion of the oil market in the world. They are in interdependent. Firms are aware of each other's action and consider them when making pricing decision. Now, OPEC, what they do, they, these countries, they meet and they decide what the price is. They're aware of each other's action. Barriers to entry is high. 
Okay, high entry barriers prevent new firms from easily entering the market. So you cannot just produce oil. It's not that easy. You need to find it in the ground first. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Product differentiation, sometimes it may be differentiated, sometimes it's not. For example, oil, it's not differentiated. Oil is the same whether you bought it from Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, Iran, or Algeria. It's all the same oil. Pricing strategies. Firm consider the action and reaction of their competitors. So they cannot just you know, increase and reduce prices. They do that, for example, for OPEC, but there are political consequences to that. Sometimes what you have is collusive pricing. In a legal collusion, firms agree to fix prices or output level to maximize collective profit. So what happened in the news every once in a while, you would say that OPEC, they, they met and they wanted to cut output by 3, billion, 3 million barrels per day. They, they can do that. A price leadership, sometimes one dominant firm sets pricing trend and other firms will follow. For example, in OPEC, you got Saudi Arabia is one of the largest. And if, if Saudi Arabia cuts their output, the rest would follow. And if they increase, the rest would follow. It gives them basically the signal. Strategic pricing firms strategically adjust prices based on their assessment of competitor responses, market condition, and their own cost structure. For example, during COVID, they cut down their production because they don't want to produce the oil and put it, you know, uh, put it in storage and not sell it, then they have to reduce their prices. What do they do? They invest in research. They don't, you know, they invest in research and development, marketing and innovation to differentiate their product. For example, uh, for oil companies, they really don't need any marketing because everybody needs oil. In a nutshell, those are the four common market structure that you need to be familiar with as far as the CPA exam. What should you do now to learn more about these market structure? Go to Farhat Lectures and practice MCQs, multiple choice questions. That's gonna help you what? Do better on the CPA exam. I can only help explain the concept. You got to learn it, you got to do well on the exam. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.